ladies and gentlemen. So it's a pleasure and an honor for me uh, to welcome you here in the, the beautiful residence of Belgium in Washington, D.C. Uh, and before um, we, we, we start, let me tell you why is this uh, a very important event also for me personally, not just as an ambassador of Belgium. Well, you know how much Belgium uh, has been uh, afflicted by World War I. We had war on our soil for four long years. If you go to Flanders, the area around Ypres, the landscape has been uh, definitely changed by the war. The amount of munitions that was used, the millions of tons. So I was um, uh, always uh, in touch with the feeling of World War I. It's part of the collective memory of Belgium. Um, just for you to know, my father was born in 1915. So I was a late child, he was 47 when I was born. But being born in 1915, at the time of the war, uh, his parents gave him the name of Albert, the first name of Albert. Why? Because it was the name of our king at the time. And the king had shown the courage of, uh, not only his own courage, but the courage of all the people to resist aggression. And uh, indeed, for four years, uh, the Belgian armed forces managed to keep a very small part of our territory free from occupation uh, behind uh, a small river. Um, so the whole population suffered during the war. Uh, it is also, I think, a testimony to the strong cooperation between America and Belgium. Because at the time, something little known except by historians, Albert Hoover, the future U.S. president, uh, established a commission to help poor little Belgium. And indeed, there was a lot of relief coming from the United States to support the Belgian population at the time of occupation and war. And also maybe given that past, uh, back 10 years ago when I was a political director of the foreign ministry, the Prime Minister was looking for uh, someone to uh, organize uh, ceremonies around the centenary of World War I. And uh, there was uh, a commissioner general coming from uh, Western Flanders, so the area where the fighting took place for four years, but he needed a deputy and a French-speaking one. You know, that's the typical Belgian balance. We need a Flemish guy and a French-speaking guy, and they work as, as a team. And indeed, I was uh, nominated by the prime minister to be the French-speaking deputy. Uh, and so for quite a few years, in addition to my work at the foreign ministry, I was involved in preparing all the ceremonies about World War I. And I can assure you that uh, it's still uh, that long uh, after the war, so 100 years, it still speaks a lot to Belgian citizens. Of course, no one was born at the time, but it, it just tells you how much uh, remains in the collective memory of the Belgian people. And so when we speak about this museum uh, that I visited actually uh, about 10 years ago, it really speaks to our heart uh, and to the whole Belgian population. So what you're going to see is really uh, partly the essence of Belgium. So um, let me now give the floor to uh, my colleague from the Flemish representation in New York, who will go a bit deeper into the topic. So Eve, please. Uh, my name is Yves Walters. I represent the Flemish government in the United States, based in New York, but uh, good friends with uh, Ambassador Zippo. So, as the ambassador said in Belgium, you always need a French speaking and a Flemish speaking, a uh, uh, French speaking and a Flemish. He's the French speaking one, although he speaks perfect Dutch, and I'm the Flemish one, <laughs> if I can call it like that. Um, I'm not going to go in depth about, in, into too much depth uh, about. Uh, that, sorry, about the lecture because that's why we have those two people here, Peter and Dominic. I do want to say a big thank you to a number of people. Uh, first of all, Ambassador, for allowing us to use the residence. Thank you very much. I think it's a successful uh, <laughs> recipe, and uh, particularly the macaroons were stunning. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to say a big word of thank you to Paul Taylor from the Smithsonian, who is part of the whole program and process, and also, <laughs> and 
and also uh, Brian, and I'm looking for Brian. Ah, there. Brian Dick from the US Embassy in uh, Brussels, who are also uh, involved in a financial way, in a big way, in uh, this whole project. Um, so thank you very much. I think we aim for about 50 people, and we're close to that. So uh, it's a uh, interesting and uh, a good turnout as well. So guys, you have a big task to fill uh, to make sure that these people are entertained uh, in a good way. Um, the ambassador spoke about World War One and World War Two. Um, his father, born in World War One, um, my mother and father just born a few years before the start of World War II. So in that way, we do have some things in common. Um, and Dominique and Peter, I know we're gonna see you in New York next week, but I'm looking forward to hear your story and we'll see you also on uh, Sunday. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, having us, uh, especially uh, Eve and uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, and indeed, um, while I heard your introduction, it again struck me how the First World War binds us all together. Um, because Paul Brenner, to whom you were referring as, as Commissar General, is a very, he's actually one of the founding fathers of our museum, because he was then mayor of Ypres, and he's a very good friend whom we see at least every, um, every two weeks. And I had an uncle, born in 1915, and guess his name was Albert, for the very same reason. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, the ambassador has already briefly uh, spoken about what uh, America meant to Belgium um, in the First World War. Well, we're not going into that subject today. Uh, today is really on the philosophy of the museum um, as a war museum, as a First World War museum, and how uh, we think this is very relevant for the world today. However, um, there are two more talks that we are uh, host that we are um, holding in Washington DC during our stay. There is one Sunday morning um, on especially the Indian involvement in the First World War in the Sea Gurdwara in uh, Silver Spring. And there's a public talk on Tuesday evening in Tudor Place, just down the road in Georgetown, um, which is hosted by our friend Rob De Hart. And I point him out because it's really how, it's really coincidence, he was once, long time ago, our first international intern. And now he's a curator, a curator at Tudor Place. So, um, and it's very nice to see him uh, today. So the title is Curating War, a multivocal inclusive representation of uh, World War I at the In Flanders Fields Museum. And I'll just take the text with me. Um, not that I won't be able to uh, know what to say, but it's just that I don't forget uh, any uh, things. So um, this, this presentation has several sections, so a brief reflection on the definition of a museum, which you see here for those among um, in the audience who are not museum professor, uh, professionals. And then I will briefly sketch the reason for being and the prehistory of in Flanders Fields Museum and subsequently I will elaborate on the philosophy, the vision and the mission of the museum and how it is translated um, into a permanent um, exhibition. And my colleague Peter will then elaborate on the concepts of agonistic memory and inclusivity in a war museum by focusing on one particular research project called the list of names. So at this stage, this might all seem gibberish to you but we hope that after the presentation, you will share our enthusiasm for the ambitious project that in Flanders Fields Museum is. But let me start to explain, or for those in the museum profession, to remind you what a museum is according to the International Council of Museums. So a museum is a not-for-profit permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. Open to the public, accessible and exclusive, museums foster diversity and sustainability. So in the case of In Flanders Fields Museum, we are governed by the city of Ypres, um, so that covers the not-for-profit and the permanent part. We do have a collection of about 100,000 items, 
12,000 3D objects, uh, so it's actually not such a rich collection, 35,000 photos and as many documents, and a library of about 20,000 books and 25,000 periodicals on the First World War. So just a fraction of this is displayed in the permanent exhibition. And apart from the permanent exhibition, uh, we host several temporary exhibitions per year, some of which focus on objects and are a result of research into the collection. And some are historical uh, exhibitions where the narrative uh, prevails and which are based on historical research. So through our focus on personal stories and by taking into account um, remembrance rituals, documenting and enhancing um, intangible heritage is an integral part of our activities too. So we're open throughout the year, in summer even seven days on seven. All texts in the museum are quadrilingual, in Dutch or mother tongue, in the other two official languages, French and German, and obviously in English. And while in Flanders Fields Museum I share these elements with many other museums, I think we make a difference in our approach to the subject of war. In our case, the First World War. And with the particular challenges of inclusivity and diversity when treating this highly important but equally delicate subject. The reasons why there is a First World War Museum in Ypres is obvious to those familiar with our history. During that war the town was the centre of an infamous salient. So a salient is actually a bulge in the front line. And when you were at Ypres on the front you could be shot at from three sides. So that's not really the place you want to be um, during a war. Um, and while the first shots were heard in early October 1914, the war would only leave the Ypres salient in the middle of October 1918. So it's really four years of non-stop war. And during those four years, about half a million people lost their lives in this small section. Because from here to there, that's maybe 10 miles, not more. It's really a very... Um, and briefly something on uh, spelling. Um, you will often see Ypres, Y-P-R-E-S, which is actually the French name which is also used in uh, English. And then the current Dutch spelling I-E-P-E-R. But I can guarantee you it's the same town. And please, please, a mistake often made by English-speaking people, it's not leper, it's Ypres. <laughs> During those four years, uh, No Man's Land was at a distance between 8 and minimal just 2.5 miles from the town centre. And knowing the First World War was fought with artillery with a range up to 50 miles and with shells weighing up to 1,000 kilos, and that such devices fell on the city nearly every day and that during four years, you immediately understand why the town was officially proclaimed 100% destroyed in 1919. Not only all the buildings were gone, so was the population. All remaining inhabitants had been evacuated by early May 1915 and the first only to return in the summer of 1919. And how incredible it may seem, apart from some major buildings, by 1924 uh, their hometown was rebuilt, more or less to its pre-war um, appearance. Today, Ypres is a town of 35,000 inhabitants, so it's really a very small but historical town, while the museum draws between 200,000 and 250,000 visitors per year, excluding the COVID years, obviously. Um, and with one peak in 2014, where we had 486,000 uh, visitors. So for a town of 35,000 inhabitants, that's a very important economic uh, factor. Ypres' most famous building has always been the Cloth Hall. Uh, built originally in the 13th century, it was once the largest Gothic building in the world, which was not a church or a cathedral. Um, it actually has roughly the same size as the uh, Notre Dame in Paris. Um, it's testimony to Ypres' heyday as a wealthy textile producing town in the Middle Ages um, and the building combined a covered market storage room with uh, the town hall and uh, the Belfry Tower in which the Carillion but also uh, the town treasury and records uh, were kept. Were kept. Um, it was ravaged by fire in the beginning of the First World War and then gradually reduced to the pity state you see on the right of this slide. So during the First World War, 
the, ru the ruin of the cloth hall became one of the icons of destruction of cultural heritage in a modern industrialist war. It was faithfully reconstructed, as you can see. Um, it was faithfully reconstructed. The last part finished only in 1967. So we're nearly 50 years um, reconstruction. And today um, it's this reconstructed medieval cloth hall that is accommodating our museum. Um, whenever we see it's pictured in a, like uh, three days ago when we visited, two days ago, when we visited the National World War I Museum um, in Kansas City, uh, it's always give you pride to say, oh, hey, there's our office. <laughs> um, and despite the many practical disadvantages of being housed in a listed pseudo medieval building, so no circular route in the museum, uh, no restrooms in the permanent gallery, um, but there is no better place. Um, because to us, our home, the cloth hall, is also the most important object in our collection. As battlefield tourism either is trained of as part of pilgrimage to a grave or a memorial or out of sheer curiosity to see the ravages of war took off as soon as the war was over, it didn't take long before Ypres has its own, had its own war museum. So initially before the Second World War it was a private enterprise run by a British veteran, um, that's the poster of that museum. Um, and then later from the 1950s it was a municipal museum housed in the cloth hall but a rather traditional and modest affair. Uh, stuff on display without too much context, with a focus on pure military history. It also had just one employee, and that was the guard. And I was told that once, and this is really a true anecdote, once a British coach driver asked me, ah, is the guy uh, still around, the guards? Yeah. Um, if I gave him a bottle of whiskey, the whole coach could enter for free. So that's the state of affairs, how it was at that time. But by the mid-1990s, after the historiography of the First World War had taken a cultural turn, with, for instance, our colleagues in the Historiel de la Grande Guerre in France opening in 1992, and a decade after Pope John Paul II, during his visit to Ypres, had proclaimed Ypres to be a city of peace, with a duty to promote peace, um, the local governments, headed by Paul Brenner at that point, uh, decided that it was time to create a brand new professionalized museum. And that museum opened in April 1998. So it will soon celebrate its 25th birthday in Flanders Fields Museum. So despite or because of the rather limited collection it held, um, because some private collectors have a lot more stuff on the First World War than actually we hold. Um, the Inflanders Fields Museum wanted from the outset to be a different kind of war museum. It wanted to be a local museum, by local people, on the local history, but for a worldwide audience. It wanted to be a museum that focused on the individual experience of war, including all kinds of expressions of that war experience, art, music, poetry, and other artistic expressions. As from 2006, we included the principle of the landscape as last witness. In Flanders Fields Museum is also an activist museum, which takes an inclusive and global approach to the First World War. And we study the history of that war for a better understanding of the world today. And now I'll go through these different points. Um, we're a local museum, which means that we tell the war as it happened in Flanders. Not on the Somme, not in Verdun, not, nor on other fronts. Because the history of the First World War in Belgium, that's the history we know best. It's also part of our history. And we briefly elaborated that. Uh, most of the colleagues have roots in our region have their own First World War related stories. And as a consequence, there is an emotional involvement. And that's very important, because a subject such as war should not be approached only with the head, but also with the heart. Um, a local museum does not mean it's about so, so only about local people. Um, man, and this will be stated several times during the talk, man from more than 120 different nations, actual UN member states, died in Flanders. And our museum is about all of them. 
And as a museum of the experience of war in Flanders, um, our museum wants to tell the First World War as it has been lived by people. It is more a museum of war experience than of the facts and figures of war. When we made the museum, um, way back in 1998, there were still veterans of the First World War around, but they were disappearing fast. Um, I remember the visit of the late Queen Elizabeth II to the museum, November 1988. She was greeted by some 20 veterans of the First World War, most of them Canadians. Um, the youngest was 97, and he had lied about his age to join up. <laughs> and the average age was 101. So they were disappearing fast. So one of the ideas was to make the museum a tool to pass on the stories from uh, our generation, my generation even, still had known from first hand, to younger generations who never have heard the stories from first hand. So by presenting personal stories in the museum, we would make the new generation empathize with those of the past. Um, so the, the other idea was to stick faces on headstones, because around Ypres there are more than 150 military cemeteries, and uh, mostly British, and they're beautifully laid out. But it's very hard to imagine that underneath each of these thousands of headstones, there's a real person who was someone's son, who was maybe married, uh, who might have had children, etc. Um, and equally important is that by focusing on individual stories, one is able to transcend boundaries of time, place and adherence. What happened to a French, British or American soldier in the trenches was altogether not different than what happened to a German soldier. What happened to a Belgian civilian in the First World War, losing his home, being forced to flee, etc., is altogether not that different as what ha is happening to a Ukrainian civilian today. Um, the context might be different, but what war does to people is quite similar. And finally, focusing on individual war experiences allows to show the complexity of war beyond simplistic black and white thinking. An individual German officer might give proof of great humanity despite the fact that he was serving on the wrong side. Uh, while a British soldier might have committed acts of cruelty despite having fought on the right side. Admitted, this makes for a highly subjective narrative and witnesses might even contradict one another. Yet no museum and certainly no historical narrative, whatever its medium, is really objective. So realizing this is even better to admit and even clearly shows uh, this subject, it is better to show that subject, subjectivity. Uh, most subjective of all are perhaps artistic expressions such as poems, music, paintings, drawings. They play an important role in our museum as art has the capability to give expression to what mere words cannot convey. If you want to show how war was experienced, art must be included. The landscape as last witness, and this is an important insight that came after the museum opened in 1998 and we adopted it. First in temporary exhibitions as from 2006 and then in 2012 in the new permanent exhibition of the museum. In pace with the disappearance of the very last witnesses, the generation that had lived through the war, there was the ascent of conflict archaeology in the first years of the new millennium. At first amateur diggers, as they were called, soon followed by trained professional archaeologists unearthed structures and relics such as trenches, dugouts or forgotten burial grounds and interpreted the thousands of aerial photographs that were made during the First World War. As an historian, I have to admit that in the early 2000s we were learning more about the reality of war from the archaeologists than from fellow historians. But moreover, my colleagues and myself realized that the landscape was the true last witness of um, the war. Not just in the cemeteries and memorials you could see around, but um, everywhere. Wherever you would start digging in our area, whether it's in the town centre or out in the fields, after two feet you will encounter the First World War. Just to give you one personal example, when I was uh, altering my house, um, and I had to dig minus one meter, so minus three feet. At a certain stage, you encounter, we encountered a black layer, which is where the pre-1914 house actually uh, burned uh, down. But the landscape does not stand alone. One's war experience took place in the context of a very real landscape. So the war happened to someone 
in a particular place. So what we actually try to do with this concept is connecting people and places. And the name in Flanders Fields Museum covers all these aspects. It refers at the same time to the location, Flanders, to the war experiences, as in Flanders Fields is the title of what is probably the best known uh, poem of the First World War, which also gave birth to the poppy as a flower of remembrance, and to the landscape, the fields of Flanders. And when we give an alternative interpretation to the last stanza of the poem, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high, it could even cover the last characteristic, but not really the last, but this, the next characteristic of the museum, it's activism. For in Flanders Fields is indeed an activist museum. When in the mid-1990s the Ypres City Council decided that the rather traditional Ypres Salient Memorial Museum need to be revamped, um, professionalized and transform, the additional assignment was to propagate the idea of Ypres City of Peace. In the words of museum coordinator Piet Gielens, the museum has grown from a kind-hearted region that is still trying to make sense of the fact that it was once a hell and in which a message has been deeply engraved. So those who would visit the museum should, it was thought, be more inclined to the idea of peace afterwards. Now actually this should be a matter of course. Um, after all, according to me at least, every good war museum should show what war does to people. And if it does that in a positive and effective way, then only the most wicked visitor will leave with the belief that war is a good idea. But the city of Ypres went one step further at the same time as the Inflanders Fields Museum uh, was being constituted. A peace fund was set up uh, to support peace initiatives and award an Ypres Peace Prize every three years. Today there is a peace and development department within the town administration and its activities are coordinated with those of the museum. So the idea is not simply to look at the past for its own sake, but also to do good for today and tomorrow. And this entails, this entails that the Flanders Fields must, uh, Museum must take an inclusive and global approach to the history of the First World War. In 1992, when in France the Historiale de la Grande Guerre opened, the Great War remained reduced to three sites, German, French and British. When the Flanders Fields Museum opened in 1998, we mentioned four armies and 30 nationalities. In 2008, for the exhibition Man Culture War, a photograph of that, multicultural aspects of the First World War, we talked about 50 different cultures. And by 2018, we knew that people from at least 120 different actual UN, UN member states had died in Belgium during the First World War. Besides taking a global approach, there is also the question of inclusivity, which entails looking at all groups in society involved in the war, so not just military, but also civilians, and giving more attention to what can be considered forgotten groups in the commemoration of the First World War. Displaced persons, prisoners of war, internees, um, endangered labor, um, and such an approach has a consequence that uh, your museum takes into account and questions also economic, social and political power structures um, such as the relationship between occupiers and occupied, um, empire and colonial subalterns. Um, but studying the global impact of the war also creates many opportunities. And this is a good example of such an opportunity. Um, Ypres, for instance, is the only place in Belgium where Indian or Chinese history and our history meet, and this has led in the last decade to frequent diplomatic use of a shared past. Um, and we've talked with some uh, during lunch with some of you about the royal visit to India in 2017. Um, there was a campaign for Belgium uh, as a temporary member of the UN Security Council, where this was actually uh, used to promote the, um, um, that campaign. Um, and this event, which after all is co-sponsored by the US Embassy in Brussels, co-organized by the Flemish representative in the US and hosted by the Belgian ambassador is another good example of this principle. And finally, the history of the First World War is relevant to the world of today. The important consequences of, first, of World War I manifest themselves not only locally, Ypres, Westhoek, Belgium, 
these places are fundamentally different before 1914 and after 1918. But there's also a range of international and transnational consequences in both global power relations and within many individual contemporary nations. And just two examples. The Middle East today can only be understood when one reaches back to the First World War and its aftermath. Just think of the Sykes-Picot line. And the second example from American history, the deployment and treatment of African-American soldiers, as well as the deployment of many other soldiers of African descent by the European powers, played a huge role in enhancing an African-American identity. Uh, it's not a coincidence that 1919 was the Red Summer, with race riots all over the states and a very high number of lynchings, and that it was also the year in which the NNACP, so its membership figure, rise from several hundred thousand to several million. And that has to do with the impact of the First World War. That knowledge of the First World War can help shed light on contemporary issues is important from an educational point of view. It is an, an important insight for society today. As with the multicultural aspect, it offers opportunities for building bridges to other groups or newcomers and our society for a more global view of our own place in the world. And this element is closely linked with the activist characteristic of the museum. From the memory of people suffering caused by war, intolerance or exploitation gain an understanding of mechanisms of fundamental injustice with the aim of working towards an attitude of active respect in today's society. Now this vision I have just outlined in maybe too much detail was elaborated in a permanent exhibition by its structure and by the displays but also in the activities of the educational department with museum guidance, workshops, tours, etc. and in the daily activities of the Knowledge Centre uh, where we are employed, research, reading room, expertise, etc. Um, so, uh, so it was, was elaborated in a permanent exhibition. <coughs> Um, let's, so let's see how it was implemented in a permanent exhibition that was realized in 2012. So first of all, I've already mentioned the museum is quadrilingual with the challenge that it has on budgets and on workloads, etc. Um, and there are actually four types of displays for intertwined visitor tracks. There's a chronological from Belle Epoque over the period 1914 to 1918 to 2018. Um, these are displays which generally have a black uh, background and who are rather traditional, uh, combination of objects, photographs, etc. Um, you also need thematic displays, so that's an example of some of the thematic displays. Some of the themes, refugees, propaganda, um, the Christmas truce, medical care, the occupation, multicultural war. Um, these are displays that can easily be changed and um, as I told you, one of the challenges is being quadrilingual. Now, one of the things we do is, instead of giving a ticket, um, every visitor is given a bracelet. In the bracelet, there's a chip, and the chip retains the language that someone speaks. And so, for instance, um, one of the challenges is you've got uh, a display case full of objects. Well, if you want a caption to some of these smaller objects, and the caption is in four languages, you've got a caption which is much bigger than the object. So that's, it's, it's a challenge. So what we do is, you have your bracelet, the chip in your bracelet, red over here, and then you see the objects in front of you appearing on the screen, you click on the object, you've got the caption in your own language. And an additional advantage is you can change the caption from your office. Um, so you don't have to go into the museum, open the display case, and uh, change um, everything. Then, very important, uh, seeing the philosophy of the museum, is the personal displays. And there are three types of personal displays. Um, you've got rather traditional small display cases with personal objects. Um, like this one is on Charles Snelling. Simple, but very moving. I mean, what you see in this display case is the wallet that British soldier Private Snelling was wearing when he was killed. You see that it has been pierced by a part of shell and that the photograph he was carrying of his wife and daughter has been uh, shell marked as well. And next to it is a photograph of some years earlier which hung in the kitchen at home where you would see him 
with his wife and daughter, clearly some years younger. Very simple, but still very effective. And then we've got a number of um, witness accounts. Um, this is actually uh, representing Willy Siebert. Uh, we choose to have the witness accounts read by actors. They're filmed in a very high resolution, life size, and they address the audience. And they tell what happened to them. And everything you see, everything you hear is genuine apart from the actor. So it's proper dress and you can't see it here, but it's, there is also always an object that belonged to that person in front of the screen on the display case. Um, Willy Siebert, who's represented here, actually that's, it's an amazing story. Um, it's the most poignant account of the first chemical attack in world history, which happened at Ypres. And it came from the States because Willy Siebert, who was one, a German gas pioneer, um, migrated in the early 20s, settled in California. And when his son Bill, born in the States, wanted to join up in the Second World War, he told his story of going through that first gas attack as one of the German perpetrators, but still a very humanist uh, vision. Um, he told how what had happened to him. So it's act, act, actually a German gas pioneer, but he wrote everything down in English. So. Um, and then the third type of personal encounters is, again, we're using the bracelets. Um, visitors can um, enter their personal details when they enter the museum, say who they are, their age, their gender, etc., and where they're from. And throughout the museum, you've got a number of booths where you can have the chip read, and you will get two stories of someone who was in Flanders during the First World War. And at least one of the stories, and it's a large database with now about 600 um, or even more personal stories, most of them given by family members, at least one of the stories you will get with photographs, etc., is of someone who matches your profile. For instance, if you would enter as a visitor from, I do not know if there's a, a, a story of someone from Washington, but certainly from New York, for instance, if, as a visitor from New York, you would visit the museum and you would say, enter, that you're, you will get the story of a soldier from New York who was in Flanders during the First World War. Yeah. And at the end of the museum, you can log out and then the story will be sent to you with reference to a place where he or she has been. If he died or she died, it's usually the grave or a memorial. If he survived the place where he has been during the war. Um, and then it's a museum on war, which means that uh, you have to show the most ugly face of war. Um, but that's also very delicate because we do not want to be part of a dark tourism attraction. And it's, it's very delicate how to show the most ugly face of war. So we constructed four beacons in the cloth hole, which you enter your, in an enclosed space. And what we actually show you there is, well, these are just three of the four beacons. For instance, um, these are posthumous photographs of some of the very early Belgian casualties of the First World War, uh, taken at Votem near Liège, um, taken by the local priest. So he took photographs of the soldiers who fell in order to have them identified later on. So it's actually a, 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 a work of humanity or photographs taken by the Germans immediately after the first gas attack, or survivors, but survivors who were heavily mutilated in the face. So, uh, because we thought it was very important that we should never lose sight of the fact what war actually does. Um, and then just some special things before I hand over the mic to uh, Peter. Um, the Belfry Tower, the tower in the middle, of the building is included in, or can be included in the visit because it offers a brilliant view of the landscape surrounding the battlefield surrounding uh, the Ypres and at the same time a carillion is a uh, instrument of commemoration. Just think of the Dutch, the Netherlands carillion next to Arlington Cemetery which is also uh, an object of commemoration. And then we've got some special cases, I'll just point two uh, to you. Um, this display is called In Flanders Earth, and it's basically the Google Earth of the First World War. What it does is, um, our colleague Birger 
has assembled as part of his PhD 25,000 aerial photographs of the First World War and he has actually um, calibrated them on today's landscape. So everybody, for, if, if you're a local, you can look up where you live and it covers actually every square meter of the whole province of West Flanders can be covered with an aerial photograph of the First World War. So you can actually look up where you live and see was there a trench in my garden, for instance. Or if you have an ancestor who died in Belgium, uh, you can go and see how the place where he died or where he's commemorated looked during the First World War. Um, so it's really an immense tool. And our most favorite object, so I'll just point it out to you because it's an amazing thing, is in the middle of that display, you see a tree trunk. And the tree was actually planted around the time of the American Revolution. So last quarter, 18th century. Survived the First World War and was only felled in the uh, 1990s. But when they cut the tree in the 1990s, they saw that it got hit by a shell during the First World War and that it had entered the wounds. There is some, uh, a thing as uh, tree stress. And so the black marks you see are actually the year rings of the First World War. And for us it was like a symbol of the landscape in our part of Flanders, which also retains all these marks of the uh, First World War. And the last thing I wanted to point out is uh, the way we display uniforms. As I told you, we're rather a museum of experience of war than the facts and figures of war, but of course uniforms are highly important aspects. Uh, we decided not to use models. We decided to show uniforms in two different ways. This is the 1914 display, where you see uh, part of the French uniform. I chose this photograph because it shows you how we try to integrate the multicultural part. So it's a French uniform, but clearly you, you see the um, uniform of a tirailleur Senegalais, who was from actually the whole of French Black Africa. Um, or the Shesia of North African troops. So we integrated it. It's not that we just have, we do have a special display dedicated to colonial troops, but at the same time, we integrated the colonial troops in a whole display, not to single them out. They've been enough singled out. So, um, and then this is the display of the American uniform as it was in 1918. And that idea was quite simple. Um, it was, let's show everything one soldier carries when he goes to the front line. And then we just laid it out horizontally on the floor, and then we've put that upright. Uh, so that you get an idea of, uh, it was nearly 30 kilos that one soldier had to carry along. Um, so we're just trying to find a new way of making uh, First World War displays. Peter, I'm thirsty, so I'll have a, I'll have a sip. Hello, thank you, thank you, Dominic for this elaborate introduction. Now, um, inclusiveness, multivocality, five continents and Flanders, the focus on the personal experience, the landscape as a last witness. If there is one thing where all these elements come together, then it must be our long-term and always ongoing project, the list of names. The list of names is a research uh, project which which aims to draw up an inclusive register of both of civilians and military of any origin whose death is related to the First World War in Belgium. It includes approximately 600,000 war dead with origins in, already mentioned, 120 present-day countries. Now, based on um, public and uh, private archives, casualty lists, war graves commissions, registers, photographs, literal, um, literature, witness accounts and mem memories or material coming from direct relatives, the list of names intends to map out as much as information as possible on each individual. And um, here you see the ever ongoing uh, dimension of the project, of course. But all this information is uh, preserved in a well-structured <coughs> content management system that was especially designed um, to suit the museum's needs, uh, operations and applications. And this makes the, uh, the, the list of names a unique tool. Um, and it does so on uh, different levels. Let me explain that uh, a little further. So, 
First of all, you have research purposes. The list of names departs from a critical attitude towards um, existing numbers of casualties of this, for this war. We don't believe the numbers until we have identified each victim by name and person. That is pretty much the baseline of this project. And when you have been working on the list of names uh, and you have systematically processed um, entire archival series and casualty lists and you start gaining insight into that immense puzzle, human puzzle, then you start to discover remarkable things. Certain narratives suddenly turn out to be more nuanced than usually acclaimed. The British story of Ypres as holy ground, for instance, created after the first Battle of Ypres in October-November 1914. Um, the intensive identification, the localization of French military casualties shows that Ypres soil was equally sacré as holy, although that is a little known um, story to this day. Another story is um, that of Belgian civilian casualties. Until the list of names, no historian in the past hundred years had taken the trouble to investigate the numbers circulating in historiography. So generations of historians have copied figures that were chronicled shortly after the war. What turned out, their number is five times higher. And in a similar way, departing from the list of names, you can start making all kind of, um, of different analyses uh, about how the army command handled its available troops during the bloody third battle of Ypres, known as Passchendaele, um, or how the cemeteries grew during the war and were reorganized after the war, or about forgotten groups like colonial troops or the presence of Russian and Italian prisoners of war, etc. Or an, elaborate, an elaborated analysis of, um, about US presence um, in Belgium during the First war, World War. This is the reason why Dominic and I are here um, nowadays. Now, based on uh, extensive comparison and analysis of, of a wide range of sources, the list of names reveals nuances or unknown aspects and offers new perspectives to the history of the First World War in Belgium. Now, a second, um, a second level uh, or application is commemoration, commemorative purposes. Oh, sorry. I, uh, um, the list of names, this is an, uh, an old version of the PowerPoint, I realize. <laughs> sorry. Uh, we'll get there. Um, so commemorative purposes. The list of names enables um, commemoration or individual um, on an individual and collective level from an inclusive perspective. After three years uh, of intensive preparation, research, field work, the list of names was officially launched on the 4th of August 2014 with the projection of names um, of all the victims who had fallen that day exactly a hundred years ago. Civilians, soldiers of any origin or party, all together. We continue to do so um, until 28 June 2019, the centenary of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles um, and the official end of the war. Uh, indeed, there were still quite a few casualties between 11th of November to, uh, 1918 and the signing of the treaty. Succumbed to wounds or disease, accidents with ammunition, cleaning up the battlefields. Um, to give you the precise number, 7,076 uh, fatalities uh, or 31 fatalities per day for that period only in Belgium. Now, after the 28th of June 2019, we changed the programming of the projection um, to the day of the victim's death, regardless uh, the year. That is what you, can, uh, what you can see now being projected in the uh, museum. And um, yeah, especially during the centenary 2014-2018, several institutions, artists and organizations from the Lost Post Association to the BBC um, appealed to the museum to make use of this list of names for their commemorative practices. And we are always happy to collaborate uh, with these, but our condition is always that the list of names is only used with respect to its inclusive perspective. Now, before uh, moving on to the next application of the list of names, let me briefly mention two initiatives that left 
a particular uh, lasting uh, impression. The first is um, Coming World, Remember Me, a land art installation by the Belgian artist Koen van Mechelen that was intended to evoke the impact of the First World War um, on Belgium. 600,000 figurines in the form of stooping um, human beings were molded and baked um, by visitors to workshops, and, uh, to workshops in Belgium and abroad. And the 600,000 number was, of course, no coincidence. Um, and Flanders Fields Museum was, um, was uh, closely involved in this project and the figure is based on the list of names. A giant egg um, rises um, from, uh, from its center and this carpet of human um, figurines symbolizes human resilience and the need for critical reflection and looking for connection instead of division. The second uh, initiative is one of our own, it's called Memorial Chairs in 2018, when um, our then artist in residence, Val Carmen, had built her installation um, at the museum around the symbolism of five empty chairs coming from Passendale, uh, Passendale uh, uh, Church. What does war do? It creates empty chairs at family tables. A very strong metaphor uh, that has always uh, that has also been used before uh, and elsewhere. If you think of the Jewish memorial at the former Krakow ghetto in in, uh, in Krakow, or the Red Line Sarajevo project to commemorate Srebrenica, or in the U.S. Oklahoma City um, National National Memorial Museum um, with its chairs in front of it. Um, however. The list of names uh, inspired us um, to take this to the next level. And thanks to Dominic's years of research, which resulted in the Man Culture Wall e War Expo in 2008, we knew that people from 60 different countries, uh, and coming from five different continents, had participated in the war in Belgium. Uh, but later on, with the list of names, we discovered that those people had been born in more than 120 different contemporary countries. So we then decided to bring over a chair from each of those uh, countries, symbolizing the victims of each country of, origins, um, of origin during the World War uh, in Belgium. Now, each, each chair turned out uh, to carry its own story. It came from the family of one of the victims, or it was handmade according to a certain uh, ritual, or we had a story from another uh, later war attached to it. And sometimes the chair did not get out of the country because of a war going on there today, like Yemen, for example. Anyway, 97 chairs reached Ypres, and they were carried to the park behind the cathedral uh, during the long weekend of the Armistice Day in 2018 to be exhibited, exhibited there for uh, three days. You can see that on the, the picture on the right. Uh, and of course, we have some uh, USA-linked chairs too. We have the, the chair that was donated by Robert de Hart. Uh, um, and then there is another chair um, which is linked to the USA which was the one coming from Finland, as this, uh, the, this soldier uh, was born in Finland, but migrated to the US um, before the war, uh, enlisted and died in Flanders. He is buried now in Wareham, uh, the American cemetery over there. So, meanwhile, uh, contacts are still being made to bring chairs from the remaining countries, or additional countries, to Ypres. And the chairs have become a special part of our collection and have been integrated to the permanent exhibition. This also allows us to make a statement on occasion. After the outbreak of the special operation in Ukraine, we highlighted the Ukrainian and Russian chairs, as Dominic already showed in his part of the presentation. Now, um, let us move on to the next aspect of um, purposes of uh, the list of names, educational means. Um, for our educational uh, department, the project provides an endless source of inspiration for their workshops and tours um, of their former front in, on the former uh, front landscape, where they are able to connect um, the origin of today's visitors 
with the victims who came from that region uh, 100 years ago by locating relevant places in the lives of those historical characters, uh, places of injury, hospitalization, uh, death, original burial place, etc. The stories can be brought back to life. The inclusive perspective offers opportunities to gain insights in the story of the other. For example, if a group of students of, of Washington uh, would come to Ypres and book a tour with our educational team, they could bring a story um, that also covers the fortunes of Washington-born casualties who died in the French, the British, Canadian, Australian and of course uh, American uh, army. Um, a fourth uh, important um, application of the list of names is, of course, uh, exhibitions. Um, because a core business of the museum is making exhibitions, and since uh, the list of names, since 2014, we have employed the list of names each time in one way or another in um, in our exhibitions with visualizations of our animations. And I go back to some of the, uh, here, here you are. Uh, in 2017, uh, just to show you an example, um, uh, in our exhibition on the Third Battle of Ypres, um, we composed a body density map based on comparative analysis, analysis of the list of names, war diaries, aerial photographs, trench maps, and so on, to come to an animated video um, showing the victims by sector per face in the op in the offensive, uh, etc. I mean, these numbers are just a, a screenshot of the animation, but uh, we can we know this we know all the names and the stories behind these numbers. Um, now, let me go back. Uh, uh, other um, examples in 2016 in our exhibition on Canada and Flanders. Um, uh, we, um, we mapped out the origins and the migration uh, history of Canadian casualties in Flanders fields or in 2018, that's the left, uh, the image on your left, we erected a monument that was never built for the civilian casualties of and in Ypres, etc. Now, a, a fifth element is participation. Since the project is open to an international audience, it invites participation, which creates uh, unique Dynam dynam dynamics in, um, in sharing history, commemoration and discovering family roots. The list of names is uh, supported and nourished by an international heritage community. We have World War I ancestors uh, in Belgium. And this is actually a two-way street because on the one hand they help us by completing the individual records and at best also sharing with us photos, letters, diaries, anecdotes on that person and on the other hand we help them with our expertise on this history and with material coming from our collections. Now I could dwell on for a while uh, explaining the applications uh, and potential of this project but my point is that the list of names is a solid and important um, pillar for the museum's work. And it is a best practice where, in many ways, recording, researching, narrating and commemorating the First World War come together. It creates the framework to curate a great war from below, a social history if you want, a history from the point of view of the people who are connected in the landscape of this war country, beyond the borders of every group, nationality, nation and generation. Um, the list of names is also instrumental to deal with the several sometimes contesting narratives, legacies and identities that rooted in the First World War. As a museum that is dedicated to the history and commemoration <coughs> of the First World War in Belgium, we operate in a field where a variety of stakeholders are eager to claim the war's legacy or part of it for their own purposes. Commemoration is not the privilege of one actor, on the contrary, from nation states, local authorities and small-scale remembrance groups to media, commercial parties um, and so on, tourism companies, a large number of actors are actually engaged in war commemorations and, no less importantly, all these actors 
have their own voice, their own interpretation of this war and its memory. And this results in a multitude of different messages and undertones, as you can imagine. From patri patriotic tropes of heroic sacrifice over the fight for freedom to critical reflections on the problematic uh, morality um, of war and calls for reconciliation or peace. Mapping war memory seems an impossible uh, mission, loaded with a wide range of diff diverse national and international sensitivities. And many regions and communities claim this story for, um, or are even intentionally disconnected from space and time. Now, in the museum that we work for, visitors still from over uh, 70 different nations come to visit. And some 20% of them still have a personal connection with the Great War. And the personal relationship is, um, is even much bigger when you take it a little less personal and look at it from a local perspective. Australians on the trail of the Anzacs of the First World War, people from Bretagne in France on the trail of Les Fusiliers Marins, the Irish to discover their shared suffering, Aboriginal Canadian who comes to put the ghost of his ancestors who died in Flanders here at, at rest, the people from China who discovered their labors for the first time, people from India in search for the places where their ancestors fought and died, and German families who discovered that their grandfather's war experience was almost exactly the same as that of his French, British or Belgian counterpart, and so on, and so on. So the places they visit uh, are full of memories and memorials of identities and layers of understanding. And the war landscape that we visit in ever-growing numbers with its history of a century ago reflects both public and private identities, both conflicting and confirming ideologies, cultures and stories. And that war landscape should be seen not just as a landscape, but as an anthropological landscape. It is a landscape that reflects human behavior, that represents historical, economical, cultural and social values, that connects or reconnects people in their efforts of making and giving sense of and to a war and its remembrance. And the museum for which we work we tries to address all these identities and, are, and therefore the whole range of commemorations, which at least to our understanding and to our beliefs, have to be multi-layered, local and international, intercultural and multicultural, inclusive and bonding between local visitors from all over the world. And um, within that context, and based on what I have outlined before, uh, you may probably see the potential that the list of names holds in this regard. Basically, we, we can introduce every visitor to the story of the former front region through a personal, recognizable story and by extension lead him or her to the stories of different wartime experiences. Or either and at the same time to the bigger international story, a global story. The list of names can open up uh, a thousand bridges and it allows us to bring together dissenting, differing or opposing voices to be brought together in, in, the, um, in the same space creating a more nuanced and uh, multi-layered narrative and who knows better insights or understanding rather than the vision, stubborn groupism or polarization. And that perspective reminds me of an agonistic, an agonistic approach of commemoration as an answer to antagonistic commemoration which is canonical, a canonical version of history with classic us against them rhetoric, or as an answer to a cosmopolitan way of commemoration, with its emphasis on the victimization of all those involved, with its narrative characterized by contemplation, regret and mourning. And um, in Flanders Fields Museum have long been associated uh, with this cosmopolitan model of commemoration, but I think that we are moving away from that part since our particip participation in the European project uh, called UNREST. UNREST was a European project that ran from 2017 to 2019 and aimed to address Europe's pressing memory problem. The project group was a mix of academic partners and players in the field, especially museums whose subject matter is war, trauma and conflict. And their starting point was the observation um, that the European Union derives um, a great deal of its legitimacy 
legitimacy from its foundational myth of transnational reconciliation after the Second World War. It has consistently championed a consensual approach to traumatic memory, reaching from the abyss of the Second World Wars, of the, of the World Wars and the Holocaust to post-war peace um, uh, to post-war peace and prosperity. But that storyline is, is losing its, its luster. All across Europe, populist and nationalist movements are successfully challenging the, um, the official EU uh, narrative. And they use the heritage of war and violence to push conventional confrontational notions of collective belonging with very dangerous um, consequences. So social cohesion is fraying and ethnic tensions are on the rise. Plus, since most of this happens well within the rules uh, of the democratic process, the EU is watching helplessly, rendered impotent by a sympathetic but unengaging cultural memory. And unrest proposes to fill the perilous vacuum between top-down cosmopolitan EU memory and bottom-up antagonistic right-wing memory by pursuing a third way which acknowledges and engages with widespread memories this content without losing sight of the uh, fundamental EU ideals. They call this third way agonistic memory. It designates a new mode of remembrance which embraces political conflict as an opportunity for emotional and ethical growth. For this purpose, um, unrest combines groundbreaking theoretical reasoning with the empirical study um, of existing memory cultures and the implementation and rigorous testing of innovative um, um, memory practice and that practices. And that is where we, uh, Flanders Fields Museum, got involved as a model of uh, commemorative practice. Um, in 2019, they combined, they brought the theory and the um, and the practice uh, together in their uh, exhibition Krieg macht Sinn, um, which we visited uh, with our colleagues uh, back then. Now, the so-called agonistic memory, uh, or applied to our business commemoration, is contemplative, but also seeks dialogue. Um, it is based on a multitude of politicized representations of the past, and in doing so, it recognizes the existence of a wide variety of different civil and political emotions, and takes into account different forms of collective and individual agency. It is therefore a method of remembrance that does not claim to possess the truth, neither does it pretend to resolve conflicts, but it rather seeks nuance. The, pro the project's uh, discussions and the workshops were extremely valuable and fruitful for us. Um, we were giving a kind of theoretical framework for something we had been thinking about ourselves for years or intuitively trying to put into practice. And inspired by agonistic memory, we continue to apply its ideas into the museum's practice. This is always work in progress. So we keep moving along the, the learning curve. And uh, a recent example of this was our temporary exhibition for civilization, the First World War in the Middle East, 1940-1923. Because part of the museum's, uh, bec because part of um, the mission of this museum is to narrate about the impact of the First World War on the world, we decided to address this challenging uh, team. In 2018, we had already um, scrutinized the settlement of the war in our temporary exhibition, To End All Wars, question mark, where we covered the various treaties um, uh, that emerged from Paris 1919 and sealed the fate of the losing parties. With the Sykes-Picot uh, agreement, already mentioned by Dominic, and the treaties for the disintegrated Ottoman Empire in mind, um, we saw how gigantic, how defining the footprint of the Great War um, had been on the Middle East. So we had to make an exhibition on, on this team one day, and that day came in 2022. Apart from Europe, war also broke out in uh, the Middle East in 1914. That region was then largely dominated by the Ottoman Empire, which sided with Germany and thus belonged to the losing camp in 1918. The Ottoman Empire uh, disintegrated and the borders were redrawn according to the interest of Britain and France. 
Turkish National Resistance Movement led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk did not resign um, itself to this and took, arm, took up arms again, uh, leading to the formation of modern Turkey in, in 1923. Elsewhere, new states uh, like Syria, uh, Iraq, Transjordan were created and put under French um, uh, or British mandates. Uh, this did not take into account the, um, the people who lived there. The borders drawn almost arbitrarily cut across century-old um, religious, cultural, ethnic, uh, traditional societies and there was a lot of dissatisfaction uh, among the local population, as you can imagine. And that dissatisfaction expressed itself um, during the post-war years in several uprisings, all of which were crushed in a bloody fashion. But that did not make tensions disappear. Uh, on the contrary, the, the Great War and the colonial um, reordering of the region cast a long, dark shadow over the Middle East. The conflicts um, or tensions created then uh, smoldered on and sometimes flare up to new violence uh, to this day. Think of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the fate of the Kurds, the relationship between Turks and Armenians. Um, where the legacy of the Armenian genocide um, hangs over like a dark cloud. Um, but also think of the overall impact of the First World War on the Middle East, where numerous opportunities were taken away from the people who lived there. Now, anyone who wants to understand current sensitivities and power relations must return to their wartime origins. And that was the purpose of this exhibition, to unravel the complex history of World War I in the Middle East and reduce it to manageable stories that provide a basic insight into the origins um, of, the, of conflicts where we read or hear about in the media today or tomorrow while taking into account the sensitivity, sensitivities that exist on this fraud topic uh, until today. Now, like always, uh, we started from our basic standards, uh, the human experience and the impact of war on people, our central multivocality and inclusiveness, and of course, a solid and comprehensive historic, historical research. Now, the exhibition was uh, conceived as a sort of a caravan, traveling through the history of World War I in the Middle East, um, passing several stops that evoked the atmosphere of a camp or a tent. Um, the story was fully told through an audio guide and through five films. Um, this avoided being blown away uh, by a mass of text, because there's a lot to explain, of course, on this topic. Um, and as you know, that we always work in four languages. That was uh, an, 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 a choice made to choose for the, for the uh, audio guides. And also in this way, uh, all the fascinating visual material and the iconic objects uh, could be done justice. Um, and this in this way, uh, you could literally integrate dozens of different voices um, in, your, in, a, in the exhibition, testimonies of historical characters, but also reflections or analyses by experts today, including um, um, someone who was invited today, I don't know if, she, if she's here, Elizabeth. Um, but these voices, both uh, historical and contemporary, had been selected in a deliberate and balanced way to highlight the conflicts uh, from different points of view. Uh, the expert voices gave also the authority to the expo. Af after all, let us forget that this topic was outside, outside our comfort zone. Um, in the central corridor of, uh, of the caravan, you passed five films uh, that tell the basic story, the outbreak of the war, the course of the war between 1940-1918, the Armenian Genocide, the Arab Revolt, and the formation of the modern Middle East between 1918-1923. At the end, we uh, integrated a coda in which 12 different uh, people addressed the issue uh, of the lasting impact of the First World War on the Middle East and how we still feel or can see that today. So if you had seen the five films, you know in 25 minutes uh, what this exhibition was about. But along the caravan, you could also dive into the tents um, to discover personal stories and particular themes from archaeology as a cover for intelligence work to Ottoman witnesses, Sykes-Picot, the fate of the Kurds, the Belgian involvement, etc. Um, 
the very brief uh, summary of the expo, um, which ended in early October. Uh, we were curious to see the reactions uh, along the way and they were very praising. Uh, so the most recurring feedback was that uh, it was very refreshing to discover this unknown story of the First World War. Secondly, that the story was an eye-opener to understand contemporary power uh, relations uh, and tensions in the Middle East and it was therefore very relevant. Thirdly, that the scenographic concept of the uh, Expo was unique very atmospheric and uh, magical and for that the story was brought in a very objective neutral um, non-politicizing way despite the sensitivity of the subject matter so that made us very happy of course and what's more there were no incidents uh, which could have been possible of course for example around the topic of the Armenian genocide so in the future too we will uh, to conclude in the future too we will not uh, shy away from difficult uh, themes or fraught legacies that emerge from the first world war um, presenting and commemorating uh, the history um, give you some other images um, presenting and commemorating the, first, um, the history of the First World War is our core business. And every day we are confronted uh, with or we deal with fundamental questions of who exactly is commemorated, what is exactly commemorated and how it is commemorated. And above all, for what purpose it is commemorated. And I like, before I give the floor back to him, um, I'd like to quote my colleague Dominic from his afterword uh, in the book Curating War. Commemoration is not simply remembering. Commemoration is about the values we want to uphold in our society. Commemoration therefore also serves to guide today's society. In other words, it is looking to the past to work for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Two just final words. So basically, we have been asking ourselves the same question as the New York Times did when one of its journalists visited Flanders at the heat of the centenary. At that, mo at that moment, we were commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Third Battle of Ypres, known as Passchendaele, one of the bloodiest and most iconic battles of that war, and the museum ran a temporary exhibition and project entitled 1917 Total War in Flanders. And the journalist wondered whether a museum can make sense of war. And he concluded that, I quote him, there are Flemish answers to some urgent American questions not least how to memorialize the death of a conflict with no nobility." End of quote. He found that in Flanders Fields Museum took the war's futility seriously and offered a model American institutions could learn from, how to mourn the dead and to understand their loss without triumphalism. End of quote. Such words make us, small and humble Flemish Belgians, blush. But, hey, who are we to contradict the New York Times? <laughs> But there might be, before we, we uh, finish the, the whole sequence, uh, comments or questions coming from the attendants. Is there anybody willing to take the floor and then raise questions with our two experts? Yes, sir, please. Well, as an, art, uh, as an architect and educator, the design of the museum and exhibition is always an incredible challenge, even more so when you're dealing with memory protection. And I've been very, very impressed with your presentation, and particularly the, the final part. You started to reach into the question of the artist, the landscape artist, and all of these others that can bring another dimension to this. And your last exhibits, which seem to suggest a form of exhibitry, uh, scenography, choreography, that actually is constantly being readdressed every two years, it seems for new audiences. Mm. And so my one question is, do you think that what you put together, especially in terms of the Middle East and all of that with atmosphere and, and uh, involvement of the person who's going there in a very meaningful way, do you think that's going to readdress many of the ways you've addressed these questions in the past in the other parts of the museum? Will there be a chance to rethink many of your exhibits bring them into a new generation that communicates in a very different way. It seems like you're moving that way, and I only encourage you to do more of that. Thank you. 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm convinced that um, any historical museum, I'm, I'm really talking about historical museums, so with a historical narrative, not, not so much art museums, but any historical museum has the duty or should renew itself um, constantly. Yeah. In, our, in our situation, it's every 15 years. Every 15 years, a completely new permanent, which shows that it's not permanent, but it's semi-permanent, exhibition because uh, for a number of reasons the scenography yeah, that moves on and the scenography is always subject to your narrative is first the narrative and then the scenography who has to support the narrative but also because historiography moves on about your subject so we've given the example of conflict archaeology which did not exist before the new millennium so this conflict archaeology gives us new insights um, so we have to implement it in a museum on that very subject. Um, technology also moves on, museum technology, so that also has to be implemented and you rightfully pointed out, so your audience, your audiences move on. Um, it's a new generation, but not only a new generation, sometimes it's new publics as well. Um, I mean, we moved from a fairly Belgian-British public to a much broader uh, public. So that as well, you should, it's also something you should address. So there's really a need to renew. Um, I now I've talked for my, our own institution, that's our philosophy, that's our view. Um, but I, I basically think that a historical museum has the duty to re renew itself every x uh, years. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but, um, so the, the first uh, version of the museum was established in 1998, then it was complete, the permanent exhibition was completely re refurbished in 2012, and now we are aiming for 2028, uh, because we did an upgrade to buy some time, we did an upgrade in 2021, uh, but the, the third version of the museum will uh, is planned for 2028. So between 2012 and 2028, all the uh, temporary exhibitions we made, on, be it on archaeology, uh, reconstruction, the Middle East or the aftermath of the war, and in 2025 on Belgian refugees and Belgian civilian casualties, all these insights, this new uh, research uh, that has been done, um, new technologies will merge together in the preparatory process towards 2028, uh, so, yeah. If we get the budget right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sir. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Please. Oh, um, antagonistic memory, uh, and, and where do you see that in relation to patriotism? Oh, yeah. No, but this, yeah. That's a very interesting question. But I, I, I truly believe that you can be a patriot without being antagonistic because a patriot is looking at your own situation. Antagonistic is lo lo looking towards others. So there is not really, the two go together quite often, but there's not really a contradiction between the two. They create resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's part of it. Now, no, patriotism, there's nothing wrong with patriotism. Um, as opposed to nationalism, um, which is maybe a step further. There's not that much wrong with nationalism either, if antagonism doesn't come in. So it's each time a step, a step further, philosophically, philosophically and analytically. So I don't see a contradiction in that. Um, certainly not if you choose the approach that Peter has explained, the agonistic, where you can have five patriots from five different countries and still uh, not opposing one another. That's so that's the idea. Five pacifists from five different countries. Yeah, or five pacifists from five different yeah. countries, and still not opposing <coughs> one another. Um, it's a very democratic principle, if you ask me. Anybody else? Yes. So you, uh, with the museum, you try to bring everything very inclusive. But could you then maybe frame why you choose for the Middle Eastern Expo the title of uh, Towards Civilization or First uh -huh. Civilization? Because it seems quite contradictory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 
And yet, right until that day, and even much longer, they have always been considered as uh, less civilized, civilized, and it was Europeans, European empires, who were going to bring them civilization. So what you, for instance, see in these subaltern societies, these colonial societies, that especially the veterans, they realize that they have been proclaiming to bring us civilization, but we have witnessed their civilization. What they do is they kill each other on an industrial scale. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually degraded the idea of European civilization in the eyes of non-European people. So it's much broader than just the Middle East, but it's very rightful to yeah. choose that medal, which is, without realizing it, was extremely ironic. By the way, the fourth civilization title was also, uh, the fourth civilization title was also used by Robert Fisk in his book on the Middle East. Uh, and the medal, the First World War medal, appeared on some, on some copies of the book. Further questions or comments? Yes, sir. Um, regarding the Middle East and your uh, exhibit on the Middle East, what, what sources did you use? And where did you go to get these uh, sources? Do we have no problem? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, as this um, this topic was outside our comfort zone and outside our collections, because we are focused uh, on uh, objects and, and diaries and so on on the Western Front and Flanders fields, um, we had to contact other institutions and private collections, and we were very happy to meet uh, Joseph Byrne from Chicago, who is a, a terrific uh, guy with a one of the main um, private collectioners on T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, but his scoop is wider than uh, Lawrence and quite critical too. Uh, so we were able to, to help uh, to get a lot of uh, collections, uh, a lot of objects from his collection, uh, as for the, for the objects in the show and the exhibition. And as for, um, yeah, for the sources, of course, a lot of readings, uh, literature. But as I am not an expert on the First World War in the Middle East, I brought experts in the exhibition. So um, I've interviewed a lot of people. Um, uh, Elizabeth Thompson from Washington here. Um, uh, a lot of scholars with post-Ottoman uh, roots um, who are all experts and who um, told or, or who, who tell the story on, on specific uh, topics from oil to Armenian genocide to um, Syria, refugees, everything. So, and people, uh, the visitors could meet those uh, or could hear those um, analysis reflections by the experts. So, and, and of course, just basically, we're very small, we have a very small staff at the museum, very small stuff. So actually all our exhibitions are collaborative projects. Um, and a museum, an exhibition, is just another medium to divulge, divulge, divulgate, 
um, historical topics to translate, I would say this, to translate academic topics to a broader audience. So you need the academics, and then you work with the academics, and you just make them more understandable for a while. <laughs> and you have the objects. So that's the end. So they're all collaborative projects. Anybody else? No? Then um, thank you so much for coming and thanks in particular to our two lecturers today. We actually brought you um, some remains, some of the one of the statues, and there's also one for Eve, but Eve had to run away. So, um, and these are the uh, some of the statues that were made for that work of art. And it's actually they're more rare than the original, but the original, the other ones are bigger. But children, the, the, the clay was too hard to mold for children. So children made these smaller ones, which is even yeah. more symbolically yeah. important. So that's just two out of the 600,000 uh, crouching yeah. figures yeah. made for that land art. Thank you very much and have a nice day.